Hey guys, it's Lei. Falcon Heavy launch was a complete success, and the Starman is simply gorgeous. What an exciting two days! You know, launch like this doesn't happen every single day. When it happens, our minds are filled with imaginations and possibilities. But that said, what is the possibility Falcon Heavy presents? What happened after the launch of Falcon Heavy? There are still many things that are unclear to most of you guys at the moment, so I want to make it as clear as possible in today's video. Two questions I want to answer today: What happened at the launch, including the unstreamed part of the launch, and what does this success mean for SpaceX? Let's go through them one by one. First of all, this is the timeline that was given to us. The actual timeline, however, is a, a little bit more complicated than that. It started five seconds before T minus zero minute. That's when the side booster started firing. Two seconds after that, the center course started. What's also not shown in this timeline is that around 40 seconds into the launch, the side boosters will start throttling down to prepare Falcon Heavy for max Q. Max Q means maximum aerodynamic pressure. It is the moment when the rocket experiences the most mechanical stress on its body. After max Q, side boosters throttled up until around T plus two minutes. At which point, side boosters throttled down again to eventually cut off at T plus two minutes, 30 seconds. Then the center core started firing with its full power, and at about T plus three minutes, center core was cut off and started heading back to the drone ship. Now we already know that the side boosters had a fantastic simultaneous landing at landing zone one and two. The landing of the center core, however, failed unfortunately. It hit the water at 342 miles per hour, 100 meters away from the drone ship. It was tragic, no doubt. But if anything were to go wrong with the mission, I would choose the center core at landing. Then we arrive at the onstream part of the mission. If you have been a long-time follower of this channel, you would know that before the launch, I predicted two burns of the second stage before successful orbit insertion. However, SpaceX decided to have three burns instead. This kind of surprised me because having two burns would appear to be the most optimum way to perform trans-Mars injection given the situation. First burn to send the second stage to low Earth parking orbit, and the second burn to send the vehicle straight to Mars. However, what SpaceX did during the launch was to perform three burns instead. In addition to the two burns I mentioned earlier, it performed a third burn to reach a higher parking orbit of around 7,000 kilometers and stay there for around six hours before heading to Mars. The reason to do this was to experiment the vehicle's resistance to radiation. For those of you who don't know, there's this thing called Van Allen Belt. It's basically an electromagnetic field that protects all of us from the sun's radiation. Without it, we would all be melted by the sun. Van Allen Belt's influence is the strongest below 500 kilometers altitude. This is why the International Space Station is flying at 400 kilometers above us, so that the astronauts could be protected by Van Allen Belt from the radiation. Long story short, the experiment was successful. The second stage of Falcon Heavy restarted again after enduring six hours of radiation through the Van Allen Belt and started its journey into the deep space. Notice that I did not use the word Mars, because it turns out the roaster is not going to Mars at all. This is its final trajectory given us by Elon after the launch. It is clearly not going to Mars. Here is the answer to one last mystery of the launch. No, the roaster did not separate from the second stage after the third ignition. Many people on Twitter confirmed it, and if you watch the live stream closely. You will notice this. And last but certainly not least, a little something special for our hardworking SpaceX team. Mounted on the payload attach fitting, which is the structure that holds the Roadster onto the second stage, there's a plaque on which the names of over 6,000 of our SpaceX employees are engraved. All of SpaceX employees' names are on the payload adapter. So yeah, second stage did not separate from the Roadster. So there you go. This is the complete sequence of what happened on the launch day. With that question answered, let's move on to the second and the last question. What does the success of Falcon Heavy mean for SpaceX? There is an important perspective that all of us need to understand. SpaceX is a launch provider. A launch provider. It does not make satellites, nor does it get to decide where to send them. I feel like this point is not understood enough. Many people seem to believe that SpaceX is this company that's going to colonize Mars or send first commercial customers to the moon. However, the truth is, it's not up to SpaceX. SpaceX is like a space Uber, if you will. 
it provides the ride. But whether or not there is a market for the ride, it's up to SpaceX customers. If no one wants to take the ride, we're not going to Mars. Simple as that. With this understanding, let's proceed. This is the complete capability of Falcon Heavy. It's a little bit too much for low Earth orbit launches, but it's definitely capable enough for most lunar and Mars launches. I think there are distinctly three categories of launches that can use the extraordinary capability of Falcon Heavy. Geostationary transfer orbit launches with heavy payload, lunar missions, as well as Mars missions. Currently, some geostationary transfer orbit missions with heavy payload require higher capability for completely reusability. For example, in the geostationary transfer orbit mission last year for Intelsat, SpaceX did not recover the booster stage because of the 6.7 ton heavy payload. This problem could be effectively solved by Falcon Heavy, since the only expandable part of Falcon Heavy is the second stage. Falcon Heavy could send a 6.7 ton payload to the geostationary transfer orbit at the same time recovering all three boosters, hence saving launch cost for SpaceX. I expect this to happen more often when Falcon Heavy Block 5 comes out. As for lunar missions, there is currently no demand for that except for NASA. NASA is building an international space station near the moon in the next decade with the space launch system. However, the problem with the space launch system is that it's not yet ready and it's too expensive. Comparing to the $19 million Falcon Heavy launch, the space launch system would cost half a billion dollars to launch and has only a slightly better capability than Falcon Heavy. NASA has already spent $11 billion developing the space launch system. I say it's time to stop. At the very least, Falcon Heavy should be treated as a good contender for future moon missions, a competitor for the space launch system. Then the last and the most exciting missions are the Mars missions. In this category, there are basically two possibilities, the scientific missions conducted by ESA and NASA as well as initial exploration missions for future Mars colonization. Obviously, SpaceX is not gonna use Falcon Heavy to send people to Mars, but Falcon Heavy could be used to send scouting and communication satellites to Mars before the BFR is ready. Alright, I want to end this video with Starman footages. When the fairings deploy and the music starts, it was such an inspirational moment for me. It reminded me again of why I started this channel, Curious Elephant. Technology breakthroughs, innovations, these are the things that are going to change our lives. I firmly believe it. SpaceX just demonstrated it once again, and I want to pass down what inspires me to all of you guys, to reach out to even more people. So if you love this video, subscribe to this channel, turn on the notifications. Thank you so much for watching, I'll catch you guys in the next one.